Hello, dear ones, and welcome to Subtle Medicine Radio, brought to you by Inner Spark. This is the resource for all things holistic healing, natural living, conscious relating, epic life changing, and spirituality, all steeped in earth based wisdom. We're your hosts, Devin. And I'm Mike. On today's show, episode one, Whole Being Nourishment, we'll discuss the true definition of self care, how to truly measure health, and how you can begin to cultivate a deeper, more sustainable level of vitality, nourishment, and multi dimensional well being. Hmm. Let's dive in. Sounds good. All right. So, Whole Being Nourishment takes health and self care, and I'm making air quotes as if you could see me, takes it to a whole new level. It's the art of learning to deeply feed ourselves on many levels and to identify what's needed and what's in excess in any given moment. So it's a very fluid practice. It's not enough to just jog and have green juice. And it's not enough to just like visit the local shaman and have our chakras aligned. These are fantastic practices, however, Oftentimes, many of us are missing something. Some get too caught up in the physical and are like all caught up in body image and material things. Some are like really up in the clouds and and super duper spiritual. And then some hide from their emotions without befriending and witnessing them. And some are all too caught up in the whims of the mind. When we learn to stabilize ourselves, view ourselves as multi-dimensional beings, and then practice the art of deep inner listening, we understand what true health actually is. And so in my work, I use the four body system, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And the physical body isn't just our our body, like the meat vehicle that you're walking around in. I also use this to refer to the physical aspects of our lives. So our body, yes, but also our work, our relationships, all of the tangible aspects of our existence. This is the gross basis of our existence, not gross as in you, but gross as in a larger, more collective, dense, tangible being. And so the gross is made up of the subtle, and I'll get into this theory in a future show, so keep listening. I believe we have that coming up on like episode three. Three, don't quote me on that, but it's coming. So it's easy to get caught up in this level because of its tangibility. However, it's simply the product or result of the other layers that have come together to create or manifest the the physical realm of your of your life. And so the emotional body is the place of feelings, emotions, expressions. Um, it's very fluid. It's your place of creativity. It's our our internal waters. And in our culture, we tend to shy away from stronger displays of emotions, whether it's ecstatic joy or raging anger, anything that is seen as extreme, right? We're taught to like be even keeled, brush it off, hold it together, all of these different cliches that we've all been taught. But the truth is our emotional body is our sacred teachers and messengers. I always say it's like your, your elder counsel. They alert us and guide us, and they help us to identify unmet needs. The problem is, many of us are afraid to be with these emotions, and therefore, we bypass, and we miss the opportunity for some real potent medicine. And that's really sad. So the mental body is the imaginal. It's the place of stories, thoughts, beliefs, values, visions, dreams... It's our place of problem solving, engineering, and putting plans behind the creativity and the expressions of the emotional body. So all of these flow and you'll start to to see this. So when the emotional body goes amok, it's because we allow it to rule us and we're not in right relationship with it. Most of us have really harsh inner critics. We hold on to outdated beliefs and armors from wounds in our early lives. And that wouldn't be the case if we had fully processed them in our emotional body. And so basically the mental body runs amok like a four-year-old on a sugar high. And then lastly, our spiritual body is our most subtle layer. 
It houses our divine, authentic essence and is our connection to the source of our understanding. So whatever that looks like for you. It holds energetic imprints and influences and is our place of purity, grace, and stillness. This is what is meant to drive all else because it's that place of just ultimate truth. And we block ourselves off from this layer because of the unprocessed trauma that I mentioned earlier. Um, whether it's those, those blocked emotions, those waters inside that we've dammed up, or it's from becoming sub subservient to an unruly mental body. And as the most pure and subtle of our bodies, ensuring smooth flow means optimal communication and beautiful vitality throughout, which then manifests the gross of our experience. So, Mike, would you like to chime in? Well, absolutely. I've got all kinds of questions. So, <laughs> um, about the physical body, you're saying that it's not just this, you know, bag of skin that we see and everything that's in it. Um, it's important to look at how the other bodies influence it and how it gets its nourishment from uh, the emotional, mental, and spiritual levels as well. One of the things I want to recap on is that you mentioned nourishment and then you mentioned things like jogging. Like I'm used to thinking of nourishment as just nutrition. You know, it's the things that you eat, the food that you eat. Uh, but you mentioned that the physical body gets its nourishment from the activities that we're engaged in. Um, what are some kind of physically nourishing activities that you think might be easy to get more of you know like uh like yoga for example is an easy one to think of but um have you come across any in your experience that are just real quick real simple and easy and help to bring your four bodies together breath <laughs> First and foremost, absolutely breath. And this could be like a full on breath work practice or some type of Kundalini um, meditation or Kriya. But so many of us also just hold our breath and we aren't breathing fully. We aren't breathing into our belly and really expanding our chest. And that's the quickest way to bring nourishment to all, everything, all the levels. Um, especially in the case of the emotional body, for example, we will go into physical postures or physical armoring where we're not breathing fully. Our shoulders are hiked up, our stomach is tight, and that puts, that bo that puts the body into a stress response. So it's like this just perpetual feedback loop of crap that is not serving anybody. Additionally, the physical body doesn't just get nourishment from other physical things like you mentioned, um, jogging, green juice, or moving the physical body. The physical body is nourished by the subtle bodies in an optimally flowing system. So our senses, for example, um, sight, sound, taste, touch. I feel like I'm missing one. Smell? <laughs> Smell. Exactly. These are all ways to deeply align and nourish the physical body. And then also, as I mentioned, the emotional, mental, and spiritual bodies are meant to subtly feed to create the physical. And yes, of course, we need movement. We need food. We can't just get by on these things alone. But I think it's really important for us to not get so caught up in just the physical level, because that's such an easy thing to do, like I mentioned, because it's tangible, it's here. Um, but yes, you mentioned yoga, things that are, are more gentle on the body. And I think that's another thing in our culture, we really applaud just this go, go, go hard, do CrossFit, run yourself into the ground, work too much, don't sleep enough, eat crappy processed, the standard American diet food. And that's so detrimental. So getting out of those habits and also remembering that there are other ways to nourish ourselves and 
to not get too caught, too caught up in the physical, but to respect it and to also understand that the subtle is feeding that, that gross experience. That's awesome. So I get that in my physical body, I might, for example, get hit by a truck and there's nothing about my emotional state that is going to save me from having broken bones, for example. Like if I have some kind of physical outside trauma that affects me, um, that's not a very subtle thing. But um, from imbalances in our subtle levels, we can get physical ailments and disease that we suffer. What is something that you see people having physically that when you look at, you can more often than not say, oh, okay, that's not really a physical thing. That's something on an emotional, mental, or spiritual level that it's expressing itself physically. So what's an easily diagnosed thing that you run into often? Oh, like all of my clients, this is such a fabulous question. Really anything impacting the endocrine system. So that would be any reproductive issue, a hormonal issue, um, thyroid issues, adrenal issues, things of that nature most often have their roots in the emotional and mental body. An unprocessed trauma and emotions and really just stress wreaking havoc on the system. So the so anything having to do with the endocrine system well yes and also like i mean i don't want to throw i was just going to make up a statistic because 99 percent of them are made up on the spot i don't know if you knew this but (laughs) digestive issues also fall into that category absolutely um chronic mystery symptoms like aches and pains headaches most often than not are, are linked to that as well chronically stiff neck and shoulders. Okay. Uh, I like what you'd said about the um, stress responses and how those can create a cycle, like a feedback loop between the physical and the emotional. And I'd like to use that as a segue to go into the emotional body. Um, That's something that I've experienced in my practice is that I know when I am angry or stressed out, I will clench my jaw, for example. So the anger causes me to clench my jaw, but I also can intervene and use that. If I unclench my jaw, I will be less angry or less stressed out. So what are maybe some practices that you've um, had that have helped you have that kind of intervention to get the emotional body in line with the others? Well, it's not so much about getting it in line as it is about listening to it and witnessing it. The, I, I hear you say that the clenched jaw is linked to anger. Right. Right. So I imagine that you have gone through your own dance with your waters and identified and, and are working with some, some old unprocessed anger. And most of these things are from our early lives and from our childhood. And so we are imprinted with these unprocessed emotions and because of societal conditioning, because of whatever the case may be, maybe we're too young and the emotions are so big and strong that we're just like, I'm six. How the hell do I handle this? I don't understand. So all of that energy stays within us. Emotions are energy in motion. They're meant to keep flowing. And we let them stagnate that's when we'll start to do things like clench our jaw or possibly develop like adrenal fatigue because we held on to this this event that happened. Our mind created a story about it and we now have this story that we are operating from. It's like viewing the world through this these new lenses, these new pair of glasses that are tinted with this experience and so the emotional and the mental body kind of feed off of each other. You know, the mental body is like, this isn't safe. The world's all, you know, I'll, I'll use what I see a lot in adrenal fatigue. So this feeling of a lack of safety and the world's not safe. And, you know, there are predators everywhere. I'm a, I'm prey. I was a victim then. So I have to make sure I'm not a victim again. You know, whatever the particular event was more often than not, it's, it's a pretty universal, 
theme of emotions and stories that we're going to take on. So we'll take that on. That's how we're now viewing the world. That mental body creates an emotional response in us, which then manifests in the physical body. So they have this little play off of each other. You got this new cast of characters in your head, you know, telling you this isn't safe or that's not safe. And that's obviously makes you feel fearful. It makes you feel insecure. And so then the body compensates with its, its new developed armors and, and physical coping mechanisms. And a lot of times in my adrenal fatigue clients, there's that old story. There's always stories of unprocessed trauma and deep stress and this, this feeling of lack of safety. And that tends to lead into needing to be like an overachiever and a perfectionist because that's a way that they have in their, their mental body told themselves that, that it will keep them safe. If I do everything right, if I achieve and if I am perfect, then I won't be prey again or I can create the safety that I'm seeking. Well, that constant perpetually just driving and going just totally wreaks havoc on the body, the physical body. Plus, you have this story in your head that is putting you in this fight or flight you know, if you're walking around like the world's not a safe place to be and you're prey, I mean, that's like some evolutionary shit right there. You know, our, our ancestors back in the day were running from woolly mammoths. They had to, maybe not a woolly mammoth. Could they run very quickly? Maybe like a tiger. Tiger, yeah. <laughs> so that is, is pumping stress hormones into the body. And it's like the perfect storm for creating physical dis-ease in the body and then I imagine there are other traits in their in their lives as well that are suffering too other aspects of their physical life what was the original question that you asked me about how my uh intervening with my emotions and my physical body um can help me to uh, basically get on top of and control those things and if you had any insight into that in your own practice or experience but you did bring up a lot of really interesting things one i'd like to really touch on is that i in thinking okay i've got this gross problem stress and i have this thing that is relatively subtle clenching my jaw if you're not looking closely you might miss it what you're saying is that even the clenching of the jaw is still a gross product the real subtle input here is the deep stress, the latent unprocessed trauma in the emotional body that makes me more prone to these things later on. So I think that we could get into how to process those things and that would be a, a whole other episode. Um, but I mean, so far that's what I'm, I'm learning here is that these things that we think are subtle, like clenching my jaw, is actually quite gross uh, as compared to the, you know, things that I went through as a kid where I wasn't allowed to um, speak up, basically, without fear of, uh, you know, violence or punishment. And those are my deep traumas, and I'm sure that other people might have them in their own ways, but um, I think that even though it is a Band-Aid fix for just a temporary intervention to say, okay, I'm having this episode of stress and I'm gonna talk myself down from it and I'm going to, you know, unclench my jaw and relax my hands and things like that. Um, I think that those have their uses. If Band-Aids weren't useful, we wouldn't have so many Band-Aids, but <laughs> All shapes um, and sizes. Right, but there still needs to be a deeper treatment and that, that deep stress and that latent trauma is something that is very interesting. Um, that was very succinctly said. Thank you. I'm sure our listeners appreciate it. Well, that's why we're such great partners. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, going on to the mental. Um, 
the I think the emotional is easier for us to understand and relate because we are such emotional creatures. Maybe it's the emotional uh, experience is lower on our evolutionary ladder of things. You know, our, our dog is very emotional, perhaps not all that mental, but um, so I think that we're more just instinctively in touch with our emotional experience than our mental experience. Um, so how, how does the mental tie into all of this with the emotional experience? Because I, I believe, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it, the, the way I describe the physical and the emotional feedback loop of angry, clenched jaw, clenched jaw, angry. Um, I think there's also a feedback loop between the emotional and the mental Absolutely. of having an idea, getting a feeling about it, having that feeling and perpetuating the idea in the story. So could you please comment on that? Well, yes, thank you. So polite. Is it just because we're, we're being recorded? Right. Trying to make everyone think you're such a loving partner? Don't ruin it for me. I'm <laughs> trying to start new here. Okay. So in your example, this is perfect. We'll just keep going with the clenched jaw. There is leftover anger in your system. Which is nothing wrong with that. That's one of those kind of more extreme emotions that I mentioned in the beginning that we're taught to fear and to shy away from. So whether it's the ecstatic joy or the anger and rage, we need to be in the middle where we're just kind of just so and emotionless. So there's unprocessed anger and it's manifesting itself as a clenched jaw, it, which is just one way. It might be in other ways too. The mental body comes into play. I heard you say that in your childhood, you were not allowed to express yourself without fear of retaliation or violence. Right. Right. So that is your original. I, I always in my work, we, we work to identify like the original trauma, the original stressor, because everything else is just compounded on top of that. So in your case, and so, so that makes it everything in our early life is is the root of of our suffering now. And we get to work with it in a really amazing way. So for you, it's this this early childhood thing that has now morphed into a story that has been with you on a very subtle, low level your entire life where speaking up or expressing yourself isn't a safe thing to do. And so that feeds into the emotional and physical body because that makes you angry. You had a lot of stuff to say, I imagine. And a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, dissatisfaction and anger and all these different things to express. And you couldn't without that fear of retaliation or violence. So you have this anger that's in there and the story that's telling you you can't express that makes you angry that you can't express. So it's this little feedback loop that's happening with the story and the emotion and then it's expressing itself in one way of the clenched jaw. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, we have a little bit of time left um, spiritually um, going on into how the uh, most subtle layer, as you mentioned it, um, influences the others. How are some ways that uh, spiritual um, nourishment can affect our mental and emotional bodies? I think we uh, spirituality isn't something that's really talked about a lot in mainstream culture, and uh, most people who embrace uh, their own kind of understanding of spirituality are labeled as new age or something like that and not all of us are comfortable with those kinds of labels so that can be very isolating um, makes it difficult to have the conversation uh, but I think that in the absence of a good conversation on spirituality most of us have come to understand spiritual things in terms of the mental and the emotional um, that our spirit is just maybe our thoughts that continue on after we die or something like that, you know? So, um, how is the spiritual different from the mental and emotional? 
I, well, there, there's so much in there I want to comment on that you just said. Spirituality, I think, definitely gets a bad rep because it's it's somehow been linked to religion. And for the purposes of this show, I can't speak for everyone else in the world. We will never do that. <laughs> I, I, I don't link the two together at all. Our spiritual existence, our spiritual life is is one that connects us to our truest essence. That was the definition that I gave earlier. And our truest essence... Can you say that essence, again, please? Our spiritual body is, is just an expression of our truest essence. Our spiritual body is an expression of our truest essence. Our connection to our, our truest essence. Okay. Allowing our truest, most authentic selves to live through us so that we can use this this physical body as what it's meant to be which is a hospitable home for that sacred part of ourselves our true self to embody and yeah that's just so beautiful sorry mm -hmm. just take a moment to yeah, soak that absolutely. in and yeah ways to connect with that really require a feeling of stability in the system and digesting some of this un unprocessed trauma that we carry around with us. And it's kind of a catch-22 because a way to begin that stabilization and digestive process is through connecting to our spiritual body. So this is another one of those loops where the the multiple bodies are connected and influencing each other that's uh very i would say i i just think that that's a convincing argument for everything that you do with the four body system is that we can't just treat any one when you really understand one you have to see the influences of all the other ones at the same time yeah they absolutely absolutely influence each other and it was really my intention with this this episode to kind of set the stage for our work to define some concepts and to get people to start thinking about themselves in in a bigger, broader way. Because I think a lot of us are like, oh, I feel like crap. I don't know why I'm going to go take an Advil or, you know, whatever the case is. And as you mentioned, you know, these are symptoms of a bigger root thing. So you can continually like scoop out water from your leaky boat with your, you know, your pharmaceuticals or your, your glass of wine at the end of the day or whatever it may be. Or you could figure out where the leak is coming from and just patch that once and for all mm -hmm. and allow your physical vessel through communicating with the other layers of yourself to be that hospitable, sacred home for your authentic self. Because when that's when that's happening, it's like dis-ease of any kind is, is virtually, I mean, I don't want to say impossible, but it's damn near impossible. So to wrap up, you're saying that the gross experiences that we have, the real um, expressions of these problems, those are the gross things that we can keep uh, putting band-aids on, but we need to fix, we need to uh, heal the trauma, we need to close the wound, we need to do whatever subtle thing is underneath this band-aid, and not, you can't just do that with any one of the four bodies, it has to be a holistic approach. It absolutely has to be a holistic approach. You know, absolutely. And now I could go down a whole other rabbit hole. And we are almost out of time. And I would love to share an exercise, a practice for all of you to do to begin to create your own beautiful, true, genuine, whole being nourishment plan. So if you're driving, like, do not start taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I do not con condone writing and driving. So Creating a whole being nourishment plan is the ultimate act of self-care and self-love. And it's a practice in radical self-responsibility and radical self-acceptance. And these are all values of inner sparks. Your needs fluctuate daily, depending on what's happening for you in your life at the moment, can, depending on the season, the phase of the moon even, the phase of your life, and so on. 
So ensuring a plethora of resources to nourish the unique needs of each level is the way to truly thrive. So get a piece of paper and create four squares on it, one for each of the bodies, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And for each one, identify at least one non-negotiable daily need. At least one. You can do at least one. Then from there, identify at least three different resources that you have to meet that need. And so keep going for, for all four bodies. And then if you're like, hey, I have more needs, sweet, write them down. The more that you can get in touch with your needs and allow them to just like arise and be cool with them, the better. And then same thing for each need, three resources for meeting that need. For example, for my physical body, I have a daily non-negotiable need to move, get a little sweat going. And three ways that I enjoy doing this are yoga, running, and bar. Would you like to give an example of one of your bodies and a need and three resources? Well, absolutely. Um, this is an exercise that Devin shared with me uh, just the other day, and I found it very useful and actually have mine written down. I don't have it in front of me, but I do remember that my physical was that I needed to break a sweat and my three ways of doing that were running, uh, lifting weights, and calisthenics. I also had um, the emotional need to have more me time, um, and I would get that by reading a novel, uh, playing the violin, or just taking a walk by myself around our property. So. Um, these are things that, and uh, I've got a relatively thick skull, so if they've stuck with me, that should really tell you that they're pretty powerful. <laughs> thank you for sharing, and thank you for doing a non-physical need. I was just talking about how, gosh, as a society, we're so caught up in the physical, and then mm -hmm. I was like, my physical need and your physical need, so yes. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, it's just the most obvious one, it you is. know, and it's the easiest to spot, and it's the easiest it to criticize, you it, know. Yeah. You, it's hard to criticize someone spiritually from across the room sometimes. I mean, <laughs> there are some people who make obvious displays of themselves, but, you know, I think that's why it's the go-to answer even for um, those of us who are so holistically minded that we understand, you know, the need to approach things from other angles. Uh, but still, it's it's the most obvious, and I think that, that needs to be stated because it's the one that people notice first. Like, I can be angry for days, and as long as I have somebody else to blame for my anger, I'm not going to try to fix it. But if I have a toothache for an hour, I'm going to try to find a solution. So our physical problems prompt us to action much quicker than our emotional or other problems. Right, and when you start to really get into the practice of self-inquiry and, and personal alchemy, and we'll talk about that at a later time too, you'll notice that that will change. You'll feel something and go for the emotional and mental body and figure out with love and compassion what's just what's up for you in there. There's nothing to fix, there's nothing to, to judge, just really being your own witness. And so in closing, I would just like to remind and reiterate that you're different every single day. So the need will remain. However, the way to achieve it must always be flexible. Radical self-responsibility is the act of identifying and meeting these daily needs so that you're really at your best and most nourished. And then you can show up fully for everything and everyone in your life and really get the most out of your time here. Radical self-acceptance is the act of honoring your fluctuations and knowing that not every day will be the same because plans may change, stuff happens. And so being okay with that, being fluid with that. We can be firm in our needs and very flexible in meeting them. And that's all the time we have today. That's it. If you loved the show and would like to learn more, be sure to subscribe to it. We've got so many exciting topics coming at you. Leave us a review on iTunes, share the wisdom with a friend, and visit our beautiful newly launched, relaunched website, www.innerspark.life, I-N-N-E-R-S-P-A-R-K.life. 
We'd love to hear your thoughts or questions about today's show and really are looking to deepen the conversation with you. So get on Instagram and Facebook with us at Inner Spark Life. And catch us next time, next week, when we discuss plant spirit medicine and energy healing. <laughs>